stand together and sing. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. Who will stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. And our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the king of kings. The God who comes to save. Set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Church, great to see you all this week. Just wanted to um, make a couple of welcome announcements uh, so we can anticipate uh, the fellowship that we have coming up uh, this summer. Really excited about summer coming up. This will be my first summer here on the Cape. I don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to go, if we'll survive, uh, but we're looking forward to the uh, summer barbecues that we're going to have here at the church every other Sunday. I don't know what date it's going to be, but uh, that we're going to start it, but we're going to have barbecues after church uh, every other Sunday um, this summer. Really looking forward to the fellowship there. I mean, who cares? We don't have school on Monday, right? So we can just stay out uh, together. Last Sunday, some of you might have been here for 
my installation service. I was officially installed as pastor. I just want to say I was so encouraged by that um, to see the support, to see how God has affirmed and amended your call uh, for me to be here and pastor you. If you weren't there, I encourage you to go on our website and just scroll through that service to see the different parts that were at play because I want you to be encouraged as part of this church to see what God is doing and the faithfulness that he is uh, still proclaiming uh, to us as a church together. Keep in mind, um, there's some people that are sick in our church. If you haven't seen somebody, reach out to them. Uh, give them a call, maybe even visit them. And make sure you pray with them before you say goodbye. Uh, we don't want to miss out on needs that are um, happening uh, among us as, as, as a church body. And it's such an encouragement when you are alone and someone stops by, isn't it? So be that for someone else. If you've noticed other people in our church uh, not around, Agnes, it's incredible to have you back. I love being able to see you last week on your feet. You know, we praise God that, um, that you came through. And we're going to pr keep praying that God preserves uh, your health along the way as well as uh, your husband's. Well, let's take a moment now uh, to reflect on why we're here. We're at war. There's a war for worship in our hearts each week. I read this very stark reminder um, this week from another pastor. He says, we come into worship every Sunday in the middle of a war that we probably don't recognize. It's a war for the allegiance of our hearts. In ways we probably don't understand, we have again and again asked the creation to give us what only the creator can provide. We have looked horizontally again and again for what can only be found vertically. We have asked people, we have asked situations, locations, and experiences to be the one thing they will never be, our savior. We have looked to these things to give us life, security, identity, hope, we have asked these things to heal our broken hearts. We've hoped that these things would make us better people. But isn't that a bankrupt hope? So it is that God calls us again and again to come worship him, to find the one true source of life, to be renewed again in our identity as his people. So let's just take a moment of silence now to prepare our hearts before God. Please stand with me now as I read a call to worship from the Psalms. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. I think Jesus really enjoyed uh, blowing people's minds uh, with the lavishness uh, of his father. And uh, a couple of phrases that jumped out uh, to me from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I love when Jesus uh, uses the words, much more. Uh, and he did that a couple of times uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. If God so clothes, uh, gives clothes to the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And then a few verses later, he says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I wonder how little sometimes maybe we ask, maybe how little we expect from God, the God who continually tries to remind us that he owns it all. And, uh, so as we enter into a, a time of just worship and focus on the Lord, um, think about that phrase, much more, a phrase that Jesus was very fond of. How much more? How much has God provided for you this week? How much has God forgiven? 
How much is God loved? And how, in light of that, and in all that he's done, and all that he's said, and all that he is, how much does he deserve of our worship as we come before him? Good. 
before I uh, read the scripture passage for uh, the message uh, here this evening, um, let's just take uh, some time to come before the Lord in prayer. Um, I know many of you are aware, some of you uh, may, maybe not, but uh, we have two different groups that use this church building on uh, Monday night and on Friday night. Uh, they are support groups that um, during the height of COVID had no place to go and uh, approached us and uh, once the schedule uh, worked out and God worked that all out, we had available space and we had available time slots and, and they came and then one gave birth to another and then one gave birth to a third and then we went from three back down to two. And uh, we are, if you drive by the church on a Monday night or on a Friday night, uh, you'll see the parking lot uh, jam-packed. And um, we want to try to be more intentional as a church, too, to, to just be remembering the, the fact that while we do ministry here, and this is our worship service, but uh, ministry goes on here in a lot of different ways um, at different times with Bible studies and things like that. And uh, this evening, as we come before the Lord in prayer, we want to just highlight these two uh, evenings of the week, the Monday night group and the Friday night group, and, and just lift them up in prayer. So uh, would you just join me as we pray? Oh, Lord God, we, uh, we just give you thanks and we give you praise that um, you have blessed us uh, with this building. And Lord, it has uh, truly uh, stood the test of time, uh, these, these walls here. And we thank you that uh, your church is, is much more than, than uh, bricks and mortar and, and, and uh, wood and nails, Lord. That it is your people that you have called by your name. Uh, to gather together and to worship the name of Jesus. And so we do, we give you thanks for this church. Thank you for Forestdale Church. We thank you for Lighthouse that meets here in, in the mornings and uh, the blessing we're able to be for them, Lord. And uh, what an encouragement, Lord, to know that as we gather here, um, what you're doing is so much bigger. And that's true on 110 Route 130, and it's also true across the globe, Lord. What we see is so little compared to what it is that you're actually doing and uh, your hand of providence at work. And we do give you thanks for the, the, the groups that gather here on, on Monday evening and on Friday evening. And Father, we want to pray for them. Uh, they are individuals looking for hope and looking for healing and uh, most of all looking for deliverance. And uh, Lord, we know that all of those things are found in you. And so we ask, Lord, that you would just open doors of opportunity for us as a church to love them, to minister to them, to continue to welcome them, um, but, Lord, to, to be able to, to have opportunities to be able to just share uh, that we don't need to have hope in, in, in put our hope solely in, in steps or in a process or meetings for meetings sake, Lord. We, we put our hope in Jesus Christ. We put our hope in the way and the truth and the life. And, Father, we pray for opportunities to be able to share that with all those who gather here, Lord, that they would know that this place stands for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we do thank you for these groups, Lord. We do ask for deliverance for them. We ask for healing. We ask for your sustaining power for them. And uh, Lord, um, may you continue to bless Forestdale Church to be a place, to be a city of refuge uh, for those that are here in, on the Cape and in, in, in this part of the, the Cape, Lord, that um, people could come here and ultimately find Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for those missionaries that we have around the globe that are uh, doing that very thing, uh, preaching and speaking the name of Jesus boldly in, in, uh, in Malawi and in, uh, and in Belize, Lord, and, and in uh, Arizona, and, and uh, Lord, in, in so many different places that we get to be a part of a kingdom work with people that we're not even going to meet until glory. And uh, we're excited for that day. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness uh, of you, Lord, to your people and to your church, Lord, that you are building a church. It's not ours to build, Lord. You said, I will build my church. And uh, thank you that we get to be a part of that. Lord, we pray for this uh, ongoing worship service. We pray for the giving, the offerings, and the tithes, Lord, that are given. Lord, may you use them and multiply them for, uh, for your kingdom, for the, the, the fame of the name of Jesus Christ. And for the ability, Lord, to, to be a place that continues to bring in uh, those that are hurting and those that are hopeless. We thank you for this time, Lord, as we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Uh, tonight's uh, scripture passage is from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 17 and going through chapter 5, uh, verse 2. 
Paul writes, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something youth useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, if you, if you don't have a Bible, I want you to grab a Bible and open it up to this passage together, because we're going to walk through it again, a little, uh, little by little, bit by bit. There's so much there to unpack, but I want to step back and try to see the big picture of what's really going on. What makes sense of all that we see here? Well, what have we been up to lately in our sermon series going through Ephesians? You know what's great about going through Ephesians is typically for young pastors like me, brand new pastors, we have all these ideas of what we want to do. But going through a book like Ephesians slows us down. It slows me down to ask first, well, what's God's vision for the church? And here's what we've been finding each week, that we as a church are called to have unity with one another, deep relational unity with one another as a result of the unity that Jesus gave us through his sacrifice, bringing us together as one body through the Holy Spirit. And I think right now in the life of our church, we need to hear this message from Ephesians about unity. We've got to stick together right now for still church i mean one pastor last week who prayed uh in the installation service says he prayed god you've called ethan to pastor here and satan is not happy right now but he's right spiritual warfare is real it's alive and well we've got to stick together right now in this critical moment this turning point, which is an opportunity for the enemy to get in with a foothold to divide us. Well, this evening, um, we come to a heavily ethical passage of Scripture. A lot of commands. Now we're getting cooking, right? Tell me what to do. But slow down for a minute. Living the types of lives we're called to live as Christians by God, it's actually a lot harder than you might think. It's actually much more impossible you could ever, than you could ever imagine. For us to find success living righteous and holy lives, at least two things need to happen for us. First, we need to be deeply impacted by the love of Christ. We need to have an experience of his love and know it. Because we're, we're just not going to have the energy 
or the will to live the way God has called us to live if we don't know first what it means that Jesus loves us. But second, we need a whole new framework, a whole new framework to look at our lives as believers. We don't just need a new list of rules to do. That won't do. The world is too dark. Our will is too weak to live for God the way we ought without a whole new framework to know what it means to live a righteous and holy life. So let's take a closer look now at our passage to see how Paul has unpacked this. He starts off by reminding us of our lives apart from Christ. It's like taking a dog and shoving its nose in its dirty business. It's like, why are you doing this? Uh, Look at this grim description of life apart from Christ again. Verse 17. He says, I tell you this, I insist on it. This is a command. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do or the nations, people apart from God, in the futility of their thinking. So think about Ecclesiastes, the vanity of life, the cycle of life that never makes progress. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. The lights are off. You don't know where the door is. You're groping around, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. This is just foolish depravity. Having lost all sensitivity, literally callous, callous, so you can't feel the guitar strings anymore. You want to build up calluses. You can't feel anymore such that we've given ourselves over to sensuality to indulge in every kind of impurity, full of greed, totally self-serving, just gravity of self-service. And here's the summary, verse 22. Put off this old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. You may, you may remember about a month or so ago, we went through Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, where Paul famously writes that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of the world. But God, verse 5, made us alive in Christ. By grace, you've been saved. We saw there how God redeemed us from this life of corruption, as if we were living in the upside down of the TV show Stranger Things slowly corroding away in our sin towards death and decay. So why does Paul bring this up again? It's like, Paul, you just talked about it in in chapter 2. Why do you have to bring this up again? Keep digging up our past. I mean, is Paul just being an old curmudgeon who has nothing better to do than to go outside and yell at the clouds like Grandpa Simpson? No, Paul's reminding us of the corroding effects of sin so that we won't be deceived by sin's effect. The fact that we still have to fight off sin. You see, because as we looked at in Ephesians chapter 2, we were redeemed by God, but our redemption is still in process. There will be a day when God raises us from the dead so that we will experience the resurrection life that Jesus himself experienced. But today is not that day, is it? Maybe tomorrow but not today. Today we live with a redeemed and renewed spirit and mind, but we still wear this fallen body. Our desires to glorify God and our desires to glorify self are at war with each other. So the life of the Christian is a life of spiritual gardening. The work never stops. There there are cycles of seasons and we're called to be diligent in our work. Just as Adam was called to work and keep the garden of Eden, we're called to work and keep the spiritual garden of our hearts. And part of this work is being sobered up to the reality of our old nature and the deceitfulness of sin. Because we can be led astray and start again going back to the old man, can't we? I mean, this is just like Frankenstein. The famous novel by Mary Shelley, a lot of misconceptions about what she wrote and then what you all know about the movies. 
I was mowing the lawn last summer, and I was listening to Frankenstein, this classic novel. A couple of misconceptions came out. First, what was, okay, first of all, Dr. Frankenstein, he's the scientist who made the monster. It's, the monster is not called Frankenstein. It's the doctor who made the monster. But anyways, who cares about that? Here's the bigger misconception. How did Dr. Frankenstein respond when he finally made life and, and the beast came alive? How did he respond? You all think it's, it's alive, it's alive, and he's excited. But that's not what happened as Mary Shelley wrote it. Something totally different happened. His pursuit that he was working and studying for years and years to learn and his desire to create life that he was pursuing with all his effort, studying and being very careful and accumulating equipment, when it finally came to fruition and the eye of the beast opened, he was terrified and he ran. He ran out of the room. He says, Dr. Frankenstein says, now that I have finished, the beauty of my dream has vanished and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Sin deceives us, doesn't it? It draws us in with promise and delight only to leave us empty, alone, and afraid. We need to be sobered up to these reminders of sin. So Paul repeats again what life is like apart from God. But where do we go from here? Where do we turn? Here's the main focus of our passage, verses 22 and 23. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. To put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The imagery Paul is using here is changing your outfit. Change your clothes. One pastor said it like this. It's, you know, can you imagine waking up, getting ready for the day, and then going through your laundry basket for your outfit and putting on your old soggy clothes? Take off those dirty old clothes. They're worn out. They're, they're smelly. Put on something new and fresh and beautiful. Don't go back to your former way of life, the life you lived in the corruption of Adam's fall in accordance with the sinful, selfish nature. Put on new clothes. Throw those old ones away. Put on the new self, literally the new man. Verse 24, which is created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. Created to be like God. Does that ring any bells? I've already alluded to this, but I think what's happening here, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's invoking the same creation language we read of in Genesis chapter 1, when God made mankind in his image and likeness to be like him as one who works and keeps the garden. But here's the problem. When you take someone who has been made in the image of God and you put him in a good world, like the Garden of Eden, which was free from sin, you work and keep it. You maintain the good order that's there, but it's not the kind of world we live in, is it? In a fallen world, a world of corruption, how far does work and keep the garden get you? Things in a fallen world don't need to be maintained. They need to be renewed. They need to be made new. They need to be made right. That's what righteousness does. It makes right what has gone wrong. And it needs to be cleansed. That's what holiness does. Be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Make right and purify. We know that God is making all things new in Christ. He is working towards this new creation. So that we can dwell with him as his people in peace and harmony as originally intended. We saw this in Ephesians chapter 2. God started this project of new creation with you. With me. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Some of you used to be like this old man. The old self. Adam's curse. But you were washed. 
You were sanctified. You were made holy. You were justified means you were declared to be righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Now, when Paul says you are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, he, he says, and you already know this. I don't need to tell you this. You took this class, remember? Verse 20, that, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught. Do you remember taking this class? How do we learn this? Where do we learn this? We actually learn this by experience ourselves when God made us new. It's like, of course I know how to live like that. That's what God did to me when he made me new in Christ. This is the experience and the framework at the same time that I mentioned were so important for us to understand if we are to live the types of lives that God is calling us to live in righteousness and holiness. We have to know through experience what it means that God has loved us, that he would declare us righteous in Christ because of Christ's obedience and sacrifice on our behalf. And we need to know what it means that God would make us holy through the Holy Spirit who works in our life. This experience of God's grace is the framework that we are given that we're to apply to our lives as new creatures who live for God's glory. God is calling us to do in the church and in our lives what he has done for us. So what does the renewed life look like? Well, in every way, it follows after God's own example. We see this at the end of our passage, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Follow God's example, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So now let's look at some of the examples of how this is played out in our everyday lives. Paul provides in our passage about four or five examples of what this would look like. But these examples are just that. They're examples. They're not isolated commands. And neither are they an exhaustive list that if you did all of these, that you, you should feel good about yourself and um, that you've done everything that God has called you to do. No, these are examples to get us started so that we would know what it means to follow God's example. The example he set of renewing and restoring. And so that we might be able to do this in many other ways of life that are, aren't listed. So starting in verse 25... We see our first call to put off falsehood and to put on speaking truth. Put off falsehood, put on speaking truth. A man approached Jesus and said, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. But did that really mean anything to those people? No, he, he was just being polite. Because as we see, Jesus will say, okay, I'll speak the truth to you. And the man gets quite upset. And yet, on the other hand, Jesus can say this. Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So on one hand, Jesus is speaking the truth and it's turning people away. On the other hand, Jesus is speaking truth and it's bringing people to life. Speaking the truth doesn't always and immediately bring the results we want. But when its seed is planted in by God's grace, it will grow. We often use speaking falsely, speaking falsehood, as a way to get around an uncomfortable situation we don't want to be in. Or worse, to tear someone down, to say something to someone that is not true. Because we want them to believe this lie. But we are called to speak the truth in love. With the intent to restore and build up. Just like the truth of Christ, how it has worked in our own lives. Bringing us to God through an acknowledgement of our sin. And bringing us to confess faith in him. Here's another example. Paul writes in verse 26. 
Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Wouldn't I rather do that? I mean, this is me big time, personally. I would much rather go to bed angry than stay up to solve the problem. Paul is describing someone that goes to bed angry who's given up. But aren't you glad this is not how God treated you? Rather than ending the day in his righteous anger over your sin, he relented in love by sending Christ to take your punishment so that he can give you grace and peace. So don't bury your frustrations, church. Don't stuff them down and hide them only for them to pile up and then overflow. Bring them out one by one and pursue reconciliation. Be like God, who though rightfully angry at sin, pursued peace. Here's a third example. Perhaps the most explicit example of the types of lives that we're called to live. Verse 28. Has anyone been stealing? They should no longer steal. Rather, they should work, doing something useful with their hands. Why? That they might have something to share with those in need. Our call to live righteous and holy lives reaches a new dimension with this example. Now, we're actually given three options for how to live. One, you can steal. But we know that stealing is wrong. This is obvious. So two, you could not steal and just keep to yourself. But this is where people get it wrong. They stop here. They think that they're good people merely because they don't steal. They work hard in their jobs and they mind their own business. What's wrong with that? But don't be deceived. We are called to so much more than to keep to ourselves. Here's a third way to live. The one that we're called to do following God's example. We are called to work hard so that we can provide for others who are in need, particularly for those in the church. And aren't you glad this is how God treated you? He worked hard to provide for you while you were in need. Did he have to? No. He could have kept to himself. God was perfectly content and happy, dwelling in eternal comfort and wealth. But he looked out and saw someone in need. He saw you and he saw me lost in sin and he chose to rescue us. What grace. This is how you and I are now called to live, following God's example as creatures made after the image and likeness of the resurrected Jesus to extend the grace God has given us. To work hard, not only so that we can provide for ourselves and our families, but so that we can provide for someone else in need. Here's the fourth and final example Paul gives us. Verses 31 to 32. I'll sum it up. Put off hatred... Put on compassion. Put off hatred. Put on compassion. Hatred takes many, many forms, as Paul lists. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. Do we have any brawlers in here? Do we have people getting in fights? Let me know. These are all self-serving sins meant to feed our pride. Hatred takes joy in seeing an other person in despair. But rather than taking joy in seeing us condemned because of our sin, God took joy in the opposite, showing us compassion through Christ. Ezekiel 33, 11, the Lord says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather I desire that they turn from their ways and live. It's God's love which brought him to bring us compassion in Christ. And don't we see Jesus model this throughout the Gospels all the time? He was marked by compassion. This is how we are called to treat one another. To see someone in need of mercy and rather be bitter at them or talk poorly about them to others or even become enraged towards them. We are called to rise up from our prideful seat and bring them compassion. Do you know someone 
who receives hatred and slander from others because of wrong things they have done? Be like God. Bring that person compassion. For God has brought you compassion through Christ. These examples have shown us a new framework from which we are called to live. Do not give the devil any foothold in your life as you battle indwelling sin. Remember the depravity from which God has saved us. Let it be a bitter taste in our mouth so that we will willingly and enthusiastically put off the clothes of Adam's curse and turn from there to remember the redemption and renewal that we have been given and experienced through Christ so that we can see this framework for which we are called to live our lives, a life which restores and renews, a life which builds up and makes new, a life marked by love. Follow God's example. Last point here. We have a new way that we've been called to live. But that new way needs new motivations. We need new motivations. You know, I still haven't bought a chainsaw. Is that a sin? You know, I've lived here for three months and I still haven't bought a chainsaw yet. I really need to. I mean, something in me just wants to go into the forest and clean up uh, limbs that fall down and, and haul them out and stack them up. I mean, it's just like a, a guy thing or something. I don't know. Something in me just wants to do that. So I started looking up chainsaws. Found out some chainsaws now are run totally by electricity, no gas. That's news to me. I'm like probably years behind here. So now I need to sort it out. What kind of chainsaw should I buy? How should it be powered, gas or electric? Hold your comments. There's two sources of power that Christians choose between to motivate them to obedience. Some use the law of God, what God has commanded. Others choose to use the gospel, what God has done for us in Christ. Well, which is it? How should we be motivated and empowered to live renewed lives like God has called us to live? Well, I think it goes back to distinguishing what exactly we are called to put on here. Put on the new self, literally the new man. It's, it's often interpreted by us as we read that. Put on the best version of yourself. Imagine the best version of yourself and pursue that. But when we remember these, this Adam-Christ comparison... That, that Paul writes about in, in many of his letters, it's clear he's calling us to put off Adam and to put on Christ. Paul writes in Galatians 3, whoever's been baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit has put on Christ. And in Romans 6, we've died to sin and we've been made alive in Christ. If I were to put on the best version of myself, I would still fail miserably. And the law of God that I'm trying to use as a motivating power would only just beat me down every time I fell short. This is the problem of the man of Romans 7 who cries out, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Answer, very next thing out of Paul's mouth, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. It is the love of God for us in Christ, in other words, the gospel, which is meant to be the motivating power of Christian obedience. And this is Romans 8 now, walking in the Spirit. So many of us think of God's law as a coach, a coach who is there to motivate us to obey but when we use the law of God as a motivation, all we get is condemnation. Like in, imagine an ordinary child of a talented, genius parent. You'll just, I'm just telling you, you'll just never measure up. The law 
of God is God's standard of righteousness, which then leads us to Christ because it's so obvious that we can't fulfill it. So then, after clinging to the gospel of, of Christ fulfilling the law on our behalf, God's law now serves as a guide for our lives, showing us the way we are to walk. So is there still a place for God's law in our life? Is there still a place for us to be called to put off the old man and to put on the new man? You bet there is. But, it, but, that, but the law of God at this point is a travel guide for us to show us the way. So we know where to go, so we know how to live. God's law is our guide. Don't throw it away. You'll be lost without it. But God's gospel is our coach, the motivating force for our obedience, telling us that the same God who saved us is the same God who renews us again and again in his grace. Christian, the gospel is still for you. Galatians 3.3, 3, after beginning in the spirit, are you trying to finish in the flesh? May we never think like that. The author of Hebrews writes, Jesus is both the author and the perfecter of our faith. Paul doesn't land the plane without supplying the motivational power we need to do this. I'll read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5 again. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus laid his life down as a sacrifice to God. A sacrifice that sent up a pleasing aroma for his father to enjoy. For in his life, he perfectly obeyed. And God said about his son, Jesus, this is my son with whom I'm I am well pleased. And in love for you, God sent Jesus to rescue you, to renew you, to declare you righteous, to make you holy so that we would be pleasing to him on account of Christ, so that God would look at us despite our clumsy attempts at holiness and say, these are my children with whom I am well pleased. What grace Praise be to God for Jesus Christ, our Lord. May we take the gospel of our redemption as the framework that we use to live out the new lives we've been called to live. And may we plug it in as the motivational power that we need to glorify God in all things. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, which reminds us again of our need for Christ which shows us the way we are to walk and supplies us with the energy and power to live holy lives. Give us a taste for holiness so that we will pursue it as you've pursued us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. the same. 
Be the same again. 